Hello, my name's Darren Holmes, and today in AC Electrical Circuits, we're going to be looking at lab number 9, AC Thevenin's and Norton's Theorems. Under Objective, it says Thevenin's and Norton's Theorems will be examined for the AC case. With Thevenin source voltage, Norton current, and Thevenin Norton impedance will be determined experimentally and compared to theory. Loads will be examined when driven by both an arbitrary circuit and that circuit's Thevenin's equivalent to determine if the resulting load potentials are indeed identical. Under reference sections, I'm referring to Shom's Outlines, Basic Electricity, 2nd edition. We need to review Chapter 9 on Network Calculations, Thevenin and Norton's Theorems. Chapter 18, AC Circuit Analysis with Complex Numbers. And a review of Chapter 14 talks about capacitance and capacitive reactance. So hopefully from your DC circuit analysis you remember that Thevenin's theorem is a method used to change a complex circuit into a simple equivalent circuit. So as a refresher, looking at figure 9.9 .9, we can see we have an example of Thevenin's equivalent with a load. So we took a complex circuit and we converted it into Thevenin's equivalent voltage and equivalent resistance with our load on it. And you might want to review Norton's theorem. And you might want to review figure 9-12 equivalent circuits. So for Thevenin's equivalent we have Thevenin's voltage and Thevenin's resistance. And for Norton's equivalent circuit we have a current source in parallel with Norton's resistance. And you'll notice that Norton's resistance is identical to Thevenin's resistance. And we'll be using that today in the lab. Hopefully chapter 18 is still fresh in your mind because we will be using AC circuit analysis with Norton and Thevenin today. And make sure that you have reviewed chapter 14 on capacitance and capacitive reactants. And you may want to review the effect of R and XC in series where VC makes an angle of minus 90 degrees to VR and I, which is the reference. So, theory overview, please make sure you read through this several times so that you understand what is being said. Thevenin's theorem states that any linear two-terminal AC network can be replaced by a single voltage source with series impedance. For Norton's theorem, it is replaced by a single current source in parallel with an impedance. While the theorems are applicable to any number of voltage and current sources, this exercise will only examine single source circuits for the sake of simplicity. The Thevenin voltage is the open circuit output voltage, and the Norton current is the short circuit output current. The Thevenin and Norton impedance Z is found by replacing all sources with their internal impedance and then applying appropriate series parallel impedance simplification rules. Keep in mind that Z Thevenin and Z Norton are the same value. Now we don't have impedance meters in our labs at the moment, but if we did, we could use them to determine what the equivalent impedance is. And in this lab, we will find Z Thevenin by the formula Z Thevenin equals E Thevenin divided by I Norton, since we don't have an impedance meter available to us. So looking at our equipment, the AC function generator and the oscilloscope, we're going to be using the Keysight EDUX1002G 
oscilloscope that has a built-in function generator. The DMM we're going to be using is the Mastec MSM9803. As in previous labs, I haven't bothered going through and finding the serial numbers. They're usually on the back of the equipment and a little hard to find. Today's components, please make sure you measure your components to make sure you have the correct components and that they are within tolerance. So you can see I've given you a series of resistors that we're going to be using today and I've given you the color codes associated with them to make them easier to find in your parts kit. The capacitor is a 0.47 microfarad capacitor. So keep in mind this will probably be something labeled 474 and that will be in picofarads. So 0.47 microfarads in picofarads will be 474. My measured value is actually 0 0.455 microfarads. Remember, little capacitors like this have a fairly high tolerance on them. My 10 ohm resistor is going to be 10.8 ohms. My 1K is 978 ohms. My 1.5K was 1.484K ohms, and my 2.2K ohm resistor measured in at 2.177K ohms. So under procedure, step number one, it says for the circuit of figure 9.1, calculate the voltage across the 1K ohm load and phase angle using R1 equal to 1.5K, R2 is equal to 2.2K, and C is equal to 0.47 microfarads. It has a 2 volt peak to peak 1 kilohertz source. We're to record this value in table 9.1. Note it will be easier to do these calculations using Thevenin's equivalent circuit. We're also to calculate the expected Thevenin voltage, Norton current, and Thevenin Norton impedance with phase angles. We're to record these values in table 9.2. A calculation page has been provided for you. So you can see under lab schematic we have two figures. One is 9.1, which is our original circuit. Figure 9.2 is Thevenin's equivalent circuit. So I've gone ahead and labeled my known components. So R1 is 1.5K, R2 is 2.2K, C is 0.47 microfarads, our load resistance is going to be 1K, and our source is 2 volts peak to peak at 1 kilohertz. Remember, to thevenize the circuit, we remove the load, replace the source with its ideal internal resistance, which is 0 ohms. So looking back into the circuit, we're going to see our capacitor, and that's going to be XC, because it's an AC circuit. And then we're going to see R1 in parallel with R2. So I think the first step will be to calculate R1 in parallel with R2. Then we'll add XC, which will give us a phase angle. And that will give us our Thevenin's impedance looking back into the circuit. To find Thevenin's voltage, all we've got really is a voltage divider circuit because once we remove the load there is no current flowing through the capacitor. So it simply becomes 2.2K over 1.5K plus 2.2K times the applied voltage. So I've given you a page to do your calculations on. The first section is labeled Thevenin. 
And what we've got here is our load is 1K, C is 0.47 microfarads, R1 is 1.5K, R2 is 2.2K, and our VN is 2 volts peak to peak at a frequency at 1 kilohertz. So the first part is to find out what R1 is in parallel with R2. So the formula I'm going to use is the products over the sum. So I take 1.5K times 2.2K over 1.5K plus 2.2K. And that equals 891.892 ohms. Now remember we're going to need a phase angle. And when you have resistors in a circuit, they do not generate a phase angle. So the phase angle will be 0 degrees. Next, I need to know what XC is, and I've given you the formula, 1 over 2 pi FC, and remember there's a minus sign in front of it, which means it acts at minus 90 degrees. So that becomes 1 over 2 pi, frequency is 1 kilohertz, capacitance is 0.47 microfarads. So that works out to 338.628 ohms at an angle of minus 90 degrees. Now to find Z Thevenin, we're going to add R parallel to XC. Now I want to show you how to set up your calculator to do that right now. So to set up my calculator, the first thing I'm going to do is click on Setup. And I want to go to FSE, so that's 1. And I want Engineering Notation, so that's 2. I want to go back to Setup. And I want to change the number of decimal places, so I'm going to select 2 for Tab. And I like 3 decimal places. Next, I'm going to go to Mode. And I'm going to use the down arrow key and select 3 for complex. You'll notice in the top left hand corner it says XY. So now I press the second function and I press the 8 key and that puts it in polar form. You notice a little R theta in the top left hand corner. So this is my calculator set up to use today. So to calculate Z Thevenin, it's equal to R parallel plus XC. So that's equal to 891.892 ohms. Remember that's at an angle of 0 degrees. Plus XC, which is 338.628 ohms at an angle of minus 90 degrees. And that's going to be equal to 954.013 at an angle of minus 20.79 degrees. So to type that in my calculator, I press 891.892. Now my angle key is below my DMS key. This is at zero degrees, so when I press the angle key, it asks me for an angle, and I'm just going to type in zero. To that, I need to add XC, so I press plus, and XC is 338 .628. Now that's at an angle, so I press the angle key, and it's at an angle of 90, and it's minus 90, so I press the plus minus button, and it puts a minus in front of it. Then I press the equal key, and it tells me it's 954.013. Now to get the angle, I press the second function, and then I press the EXP key. 
and it tells me I have an angle of minus 20.79 degrees. Now to calculate E thevenin, all I'm going to do is use voltage divider. So that's R2 over R1 plus R2 times my applied voltage V in. So that's 2.2K divided by 1.5K plus 2.2K times 2 volts peak to peak. And all of these were at an angle of 0 degrees, so you can leave that off. And that equals 1.189 volts peak to peak at an angle of 0 degrees. Now to calculate Norton's current, it's basic Ohm's law. So it's going to be E thevenin divided by Z thevenin. So that becomes 1.189 volts peak to peak at 0 degrees that we calculated above divided by 954.013 at an angle of minus 20.79 degrees which was also calculated above. And that will work out to 1.246 milliamps at an angle of plus 20.79 degrees. To calculate V load all we do is use voltage divider so we're going to take RL over RL plus Z thevenin times E thevenin. So calculating V load using the thevenized circuit is a lot easier than trying to figure out on the original circuit. So the formula becomes 1K, and remember it's at an angle of 0 degrees, divided by 1K at an angle of 0 degrees, plus 954.013 at an angle of minus 20.79 degrees. We multiply this by Thevenin's voltage of 1.189 volts peak to peak at an angle of 0 degrees. And this will work out to 618.639 millivolts peak to peak at an angle of plus 10.148 degrees. So on table 9.1, for V load theory, I've recorded the voltage as 618.639 millivolts peak to peak, and the phase angle is 10.148 degrees. So under table 9.2, for E thevenin theory, Magnitude is 1.189 volts peak to peak, and the phase is 0 degrees. For I Norton, the magnitude is 1.246 milliamps peak to peak, and the phase is 20.79 degrees. For Z Thevenin, the magnitude is 954.013. And the phase is minus 20.79 degrees. Under procedure, step number two, we're to build the circuit of figure 9.1. We're to set the function generator to a 1 kilohertz sine wave at 2 volts peak to peak. So this must be set up on the oscilloscope in order to see the 2 volts peak to peak. We're to make sure that the bandwidth limit of the oscilloscope is engaged. This will reduce the signal noise and make for more accurate readings. We're to measure the load voltage and phase angle and record it in table 9.1 as V load original. So when wiring up my circuit, referring to figure 9.1, I'm going to try and follow the layout set out here and duplicate that on my trainer. So looking at the circuit on my trainer, my input voltage from the function generator, remember this is 2 volts peak to peak at 1 kilohertz, so that comes from the function generator. It comes into R1, which is 1.5K. It joins up in this bus with R2, which is 2.2K and goes back to the common of the function generator. 
At that same point, it makes contact with the 0.47 microfarad capacitor. Now my 0.47 microfarad capacitor is labeled 474, so that would be 470,000 picofarads, or 470 nanofarads, or 0.47 microfarads. Now that's going to join in this bus with our load, which is 1k ohms, and it comes back, and I have to have a little black jumper wire to continue the bus line over to the common that goes back to the common of the function generator. This yellow line is going to go to channel 2 of my oscilloscope, because that's V load or the output voltage. Channel 1 of my oscilloscope will join with the function generator and that will be my input voltage of 2 volts peak to peak at 1 kilohertz. So I've hooked up my circuit to the uh, function generator and channel 1 and channel 2 of the oscilloscope and I've turned it on, so the next thing I do is put on my wave generator. And holy geez, I don't know what the last person who used this had it set for. So the first thing I like to do is a default setup. And I select factory default, and I select OK. So this puts all my settings back to uh, the factory default settings. So the next thing I need to do is go to channel 1. And under channel 1, I need to change my coupling to AC. I'm going to put the bandwidth limit on just to keep the uh, signal clean. Under probe, I need a probe ratio of uh, 1 to 1. So I need to do the same thing for channel 2. Select its coupling as AC. Put the bandwidth limit on. And check the probe and make sure I adjust it to one to one. Next thing I like to do is check out my measurements. So it defaults to frequency for channel one, peak to peak for channel one. So I want peak to peak for channel two. So I select source, channel two. Under type, I need to select peak to peak voltage and add the measurement. So now you can see under measurements I have frequency for channel 1, peak to peak channel 1, and peak to peak for channel 2. Then I put on my wave generator, and it defaults to sine wave, and 1 kilohertz frequency. The amplitude is at 500 millivolts peak to peak, and today we're using 2 volts peak to peak. So I need to adjust my amplitude until it says 2 volts peak to peak. The next thing I like to do is adjust the vertical scale. So for channel 1, I don't want channel 1 going off the top of my screen, but I don't want it so small I can barely see it. I do the same thing for channel 2, but I don't want channel 2 to be bigger than channel 1. It's an output signal. I expect it to be smaller. I want to see it smaller. Next thing I adjust is my horizontal scale. I like to see two complete cycles on the screen. So you can see when I've got it at 200 microseconds, I can see two cycles, but that's, I can't quite tell if it goes off the edge of the screen or not. So on the horizontal control, just press it in to select fine, and then adjust it from uh, 200 microseconds to uh, 250 microseconds. So you can see one complete cycle of the waveform goes through one, two, three, four whole divisions. So it's four divisions per cycle. I can see two complete cycles on my screen. I see they don't go off the edge, so it is a precise uh, view of two cycles. And the peak of my sine wave are identical. Uh, this is important because sometimes you can look at some ringing off of a square wave and think it's a sine wave. So I can see all my uh, waveforms are set up correctly. 
Uh, frequency for channel 1, 1 kilohertz. Peak to peak for channel 1, approximately 2 volts peak to peak. Peak to peak for channel 2 is 640 millivolts. Now the next thing I need to do is do a phase measurement for this waveform and the way to do that is with the cursors. So right now I have a source of channel 2 so I'm going to make the source channel 1 and my cursor is X1 so using the adjustment knob beside cursors I'm going to move channel 1 over until it's going through the green waveform and remember the green waveform is V out so I press the knob in select X2 move X2's cursor in till it gets to the yellow waveform which is my input voltage and it's kinda hard to tell it says 35 microseconds there but I like it to be a little more precise so I'm going to show you how I do that now. So what I'm going to do is adjust my horizontal scale to kind of open up the uh, waveform a little more so there's more space between those zero crossing lines. Next thing I'm going to do is adjust my vertical scale to try and get the lines going perpendicular to the zero crossing line. Now I'm going to uh, readjust my cursors, so I want X1 for the green line, and the green line is channel 2, and channel 2 is my output voltage, and X2 I need to adjust so it's going through the uh, yellow line zero crossing, and sometimes it's kind of hard to tell exactly where they are. But if you follow this method, you can see that the uh, delta between the two x's is actually 30 microseconds. So this is a more precise measurement. So this is what I'm going to record. So there's one last thing I want to caution you about. Uh, over here on the left hand side of the screen is the zero line for both channel 1 and channel 2. It's extremely important that they share the same zero line. I'm going to adjust channel 2's position and you can see I'm rotating the knob clockwise and I'm moving the zero crossing for channel 2 upwards. So if you're trying to measure the phase delay between two signals you can see if one of them has a zero crossing above the other, it's actually going to make the phase delay bigger. So it's extremely important they're both on the zero crossing line. So just press the uh, position adjustment knob in and it will zero both of your traces for you. So now you can see both channel 1 and channel 2 share the same zero crossing. So this will give me my phase measurement between the two waveforms and in this case so in this case you can see channel 2 comes before the input voltage which is on channel 1 so channel 2 is actually leading the input voltage so on table 9.1 for V load original I've recorded the voltage as 640 millivolts peak to peak. The phase angle was plus 30 microseconds. So we have to remember the formula. The period is equal to 1 over the frequency. So that's equal to 1 millisecond. And the phase angle is equal to the change in time or delta T over the period times 360. So if you take 30 microseconds and divide it by 1 millisecond, multiply it by 360, you come up with 10.8 degrees. Under procedure, step number 3, we're to remove the load. That's the 1K ohm load resistor. We're to measure the unloaded output voltage and phase angle. 
This is the experimental Thevenin voltage. We're to record it in table 9.2. So under procedures, step number three, I'm to remove the load resistance. So all I'm going to do is pull out the 1K ohm resistor. So starting off with the 1K ohm load resistor in the circuit, you can see the voltage dropped across it is approximately 640 millivolts and the phase angle it's uh, leading. So what they want us to do is remove the 1K ohm resistor. So now this is the open circuit voltage drop which is E Thevenin. And you'll notice it's 1.19 volts peak to peak so I'll record this as 1.2 volts. And you'll also notice the waveforms are in phase, so there's zero degrees of phase shift. So on table 9.2 for E Thevenin, the experimental magnitude is recorded as 1.20 volts peak to peak, and the experimental phase angle is zero degrees. Under procedure, step number four, we're to replace the load with a 10 ohm sensing resistor. We're to measure the output voltage and phase angle. It says this is the experimental Norton short circuit current when you divide the voltage by the 10 ohm sensing resistor. Remember Ohm's law and that I equals V over R and R is equal to 10 ohms. It says dividing the Thevenin voltage by the Norton current gives you the Thevenin-Norton impedance Z Thevenin. This is the experimental Thevenin impedance. Record these values in table 9.2 and compare with the theoretical values. I've now replaced my load resistor with a 10 ohm resistor to create a short in my circuit so I can measure I Norton. So all I'm going to do is take the voltage drop across the 10 ohm resistor, divide it by the 10 ohms, and that will give me I Norton. So I've now replaced the uh, 1K ohm load resistor with a 10 ohm sensing resistor, and this represents a short circuit across my output. So this will give me I Norton. So you can see I'm reading about 13.4 uh, millivolts. So when I divide that by the 10 ohm sensing resistor, that should give me about 1.34 milliamps peak to peak. Now you can see there's a phase angle and it is leading, so I need to measure that next. So to find the uh, phase angle, I'm going to increase the sensitivity for channel 2 to 1 millivolt per division and channel 1 is at 20 millivolts per division and my horizontal scale is set to 20 microseconds and I put on my cursors and the delta T is 62 microseconds and please notice it's 62 microseconds leading. In table 9.2, for I Norton, experimental, the magnitude was 13.4 millivolts. Remember to divide it by the 10 ohm sensing resistor, and that works out to 1.34 milliamps. For the phase angle, delta T was 62 microseconds. And when you divide that by 1 millisecond times 360, that works out to 22.3 degrees. Z Thevenin, experimental, needs to be calculated. And we calculate it by using Z Thevenin equals E Thevenin over I Norton. So this is 1.2 volts at 0 degrees divided by 1.34 milliamps at an angle of 22.3 degrees and that works out to 895.5 ohms and it's at an angle of minus 22.3 degrees. The percent deviation for both voltage and phase angle I'm going to leave you to calculate.
Under procedures, step number five, it says to build the Thevenin equivalent circuit of figure 9.2, you need to create Z Thevenin. To make this lab as simple as possible, we will assume C Thevenin will stay as originally specified as 0.47 microfarads. Then you only need to calculate R Thevenin, having already calculated Z Thevenin and knowing C Thevenin. You will find space to do this calculation on the provided calculation page. So to calculate R Thevenin, we're going to leave C Thevenin as 0.47 microfarads. So R Thevenin is equal to Z Thevenin minus XC. So that's going to be 954.013 at an angle of minus 20.79 degrees minus XC which is 338.628 at an angle of minus 90 degrees so that works out to 891.895 at an angle of 0 degrees now I want to show you this on the calculator so on my calculator, what I'm going to do is press Setup, press 1 for FSE, and I want it to be fixed. So I'm going to press 0 for fixed. Okay, so I'm going to type in my 954.013, and it's going to be at an angle of 20.79 and press the plus minus button and from that I want to subtract XC so I press minus 338.628 and it's going to be at an angle of 90 degrees minus so that equals 891.895 and when I press second function EXP it gives me an angle of zero degrees now if I go back to setup and change my FSE to engineering notation You'll notice my angle is 449.77 microdegrees. It's times 10 to the power of minus 6. And this is close enough to 0. So that's why I pressed setup, FSE, 0 for fixed. And you can see it rounds it up to 0 degrees for you. Under procedures, step number six, it says using the Thevenin resistance and capacitance, build the Thevenin equivalent circuit of figure 9.2. And we're to apply the 1K ohm load resistor. We're to measure the load voltage and phase angle and record it in table 9.1. We're to compare the values of the original non-Thevenized circuit and determine the deviation between the original and thevenized circuits. So referring back to figure 9.2, my E thevenin is going to be 1.189 volts peak to peak. The angle is 0 degrees and it's at 1 kilohertz. My load resistor is the 1K, so I've drawn that in. My C Thevenin is still the 0.47 microfarad capacitor, so it's still labeled 474. R Thevenin is 892 ohms, and I'm going to use a 5K ohm potentiometer, so that's going to be labeled 502. One leg goes to my power supply, the center leg goes to the capacitor and the third leg is not used. So I just want to give you a good close-up of my circuit. You can see the red line 
I'm going to connect to my uh, ohm meter. The black line goes to the common of my ohm meter. So I can measure the resistance across the two leads. The capacitor is connected to the center pin, which right now has the black lead going to the common of the ohm meter. The capacitor is connected to my load resistor and the output sensing wire that goes to channel 2 of the oscilloscope. The bottom of my 1k ohm load resistor goes to this black wire that will go back to the common of the function generator but for right now all I'm going to do is measure the resistance and adjust my potentiometer. So I've adjusted my potentiometer to get exactly 892 ohms. So I've now taken the black wire out of the center of the potentiometer and moved it down so it's now going to be the common of my function generator. So I just wanted to show you on my circuit the common of the function generator and the output of the function generator the common of channel 1 and channel 2 so all the black leads go together and they join at the bottom of my 1k ohm load resistor the output of my function generator and channel 1 the oscilloscope go to the top pin of my potentiometer the center pin of my potentiometer goes to my capacitor. My capacitor goes to the top of the 1k ohm load resistor and channel 2 of the oscilloscope is looking at the voltage at the top of the load resistor with respect to the common at the bottom of the resistor. And you'll notice I've removed the ohm meter from my circuit because you cannot measure resistance in a powered circuit. So having built the Thevenin's equivalent circuit, remember on your wave generator to reduce your amplitude to 1.19 volts peak to peak because this is the Thevenin equivalent voltage. And to do that, we need the amplitude on fine, so remember to press in the entry knob and select amplitude fine. Otherwise, you'll get to 1.2 and 1.1, you won't be able to get to 1.19. So amplitude has to be on fine. And you can see the peak-to-peak -peak voltage on channel 2. Now remember, this is across the 1K ohm resistor. The load resistor has to be in the circuit. And I'm getting approximately 612 millivolts peak to peak. Now I need to measure the phase angle. So changing the vertical scale for channel 1 to 20 millivolts and channel 2 to 20 millivolts and changing the horizontal scale to 20 microseconds. Putting the cursors on, you can see I've got about a 29.6 microsecond delay, and that is leading. So on table 9.1 for V-load Thevenin, I've recorded the voltage is 612 millivolts peak to peak. The phase angle was plus 29.6 microseconds, and when you divide it by the one millisecond period, and multiply it by 360 degrees, rounding up you get 10.7 degrees. Now under procedure, step six, we're to determine the deviation. I'll let you do the calculation, but keep in mind it's the deviation between the original and thevenized circuits. On the last page of the lab, there are three questions for you to answer based on your calculations, observations, and conclusions of this lab. When you've completed the lab, leave your circuit set up on your trainer so your instructor 
can verify its operation and then they will initial your lab to indicate that it is complete. 